Well, look, thank you uh, very much, uh, Peter and team, for having me uh, today. Tim, thank you very much for the introduction uh, a couple of months ago. My name is Paul. I lead KPMG's Global Retail Practice. It's a uh, small business unit uh, within KPMG, does about $2.5 billion turnover and have, uh, has 17,000 colleagues working in that part of our business. We focus, as many of you know, on audit, tax, deals and consulting. I am a uh, consulting partner by background, but I sit above all of the service lines we take to market. Most importantly, I am not an accountant or an auditor by background, and I take that with a big, big pinch of salt because there's an awful lot of accountants uh, around me back at base, but I'm a retailer by background. I've worked in stores, uh, I've worked in buying and uh, merchandising, and then somebody had the idea to give me a strategy job many years ago, which potentially explains what I do today. Alongside my day job, I chair the UK retail think tank, I chair the Europe European retail think tank. I teach at two business schools at Harvard and at San Telmo. And I uh, also, and you have to be very careful uh, to align yourself with politicians these days, but I used to be three prime ministers ago, uh, his retail advisor. Pre-COVID, I would travel to about 50 countries every year. I would visit over two and a half thousand stores. So I am a bit of a geek uh, regarding uh, retail stores. If you are interested, the most northern retail store on the planet is in a place called uh, Svalbard, 1500 miles north of uh, Tromso. Uh, and the most southern retail store is in uh, southern Chile in Fireland. One is a co-op, uh, the other is a deer. So that potentially gives you a bit of a flavor uh, of uh, my love for the industry. And here I come, and building on Peter's point, here I come uh, to uh, the theme of today's session that I'll be talking about, is retail dead? Now, for somebody who is a retailer, or who was a retailer, better said, and who is a complete nerd about the industry, that is quite a uh, big thing to say. And I do believe that the word retail will increasingly come obsolete due to all of the evolutionary changes we are seeing. And increasingly, businesses that do not have a legacy in physical stores will sell products and services to the consumer. They may be technology company, they may be brands, they may be uh, supply chain businesses. Increasingly, that route to market is becoming more fragmented and has allowed more and more organisations to sell products and services to the consumer. And I'll talk you through three key chapters in my presentation. Why I think the market is changing what the market is changing to, and how businesses need to transition from today to tomorrow. And unsurprisingly, you will see that some of the solutions the EBS colleagues provide are a key part of the how in that transformation journey. I am going to speak for about 30 to 35 minutes. Please feel free to ask questions afterwards. Be as provocative, uh, disagree with what I say. I present this story about 200 times every year. I wrote a paper together with two professors uh, last year called The Future of Retail. Uh, they're the smart ones. Uh, I just uh, had the team make the presentation look nice. Joking aside, if you do want to see the full story, drop me a note on LinkedIn, email me, and the team would be very, very happy to share uh, this paper with you. And the second version of this paper is actually going to be published in a couple of weeks from now. And it does focus, as highlighted, on the why, the what, and how. Therefore, please feel free to ask questions when we get there in a moment. If I look at the why, there are six key themes. None of these themes will be revolutionary new themes for you. And that then translates into three main priorities for retail organisations. And I caveat the word retail immediately because of what I believe the market is moving towards is what I call consumer commerce. 
So increasingly, consumer commerce leaders will have to focus on uh, these three priorities. The first key why to highlight is, of course, the COVID macroeconomic and geopolitical context we are living in at this point in time. In the UK and in Europe, we seem to have broadly forgotten about COVID. You just need to look to China. Uh, they've just announced wave six. Many parts of the country are closed. Uh, that is uh, driving significant supply chain and export challenges for the country. We expect that closure to endure until the end of the year. In September, we have the 20th Communist Party conference. Up until then, they have announced a zero COVID policy, and we expect that policy to be announced or to be prolonged uh, for at least another three months post-September. And that, of course, will continue to have ramifications on the global economy. China used to grow between 6 and 8% uh, per year. They've just announced plus five, uh, below 5% five growth, which is the lowest uh, we've basically uh, been uh, experiencing for decades now. And that, of course, uh, increasingly means, uh, as China is one of the world's largest growth engines, a slowdown uh, from an economic perspective. Geopolitical challenges, we are sadly all aware of the events happening in the Ukraine at this point in time. Uh, I also have a PhD, I didn't mention it, but I am a military historian by background. I just had the choice in my mid-twenties to either do retail or uh, to continue to be an academic. I chose retail. Uh, I thought there'd be more money in retail. But if I look, <laughs> if I look at the situation in the Ukraine, sadly, the first land war in Europe since 1945 who thought that would have been possible but we will very likely still be speaking about this topic this time next year and that will have continued implication on the global economy you think the Ukraine is one of the largest wheat producers in the world, uh, one of the largest sunflower oil producers. Now people say, well, I don't eat much wheat, uh, I don't really consume much sunflower oil. Think fertilizer, think pasta, etc. So there's a whole host of ramifications connected with the crises in the Ukraine. And if it does prolong, as uh, I believe it will, that will continue to drag growth uh, down for the foreseeable future. And that, of course, is leading directly and indirectly to the cost of living crisis we are reading about in the media every single day. Uh, you would have seen uh, over the last couple of days, fuel prices uh, skyrocket, inflation hitting 9% a couple of weeks ago. We expect inflation to hit 10-11% uh, by the summer uh, and then uh, early uh, 2023 there is a potential of inflation going to 12-15%. to 15%. None of us in this room would have worked in senior positions when we experienced the last inflationary crisis. And again, if I go back to uh, my original education as a historian, if you track global economic crises, specifically those uh, with significant inflationary pressures, they also took two to three to four years to go back to degrees of normality. So we don't expect inflationary pressures uh, to ease until well into 2024, and the Bank of England's 2% target rate is not likely to be achieved until 2025. So this macro context is definitely going to be with us for the foreseeable future and retailers specifically uh, those that are catering for those less fortunate in life that have less affluence are going to have to be really really smart around pricing around promotion management uh, and how they uh, appeal to those consumers whilst at the same time protect their own margins as you will read in the newspapers uh, cost price inflation in grocery retail is at about 6.5% at the moment. Uh, the reality is in certain SKUs we are seeing 20, 30, 40, 50% price increases. And if 
uh, you've got £30 a week to feed your family and the cost of the spaghetti has doubled. Uh, that is a pretty, pretty challenging uh, moment uh, for uh, your purchasing power. And that leads, of course, to the second point, cost pressures. I mean, if you speak to retail leaders today, they will tell you cost, cost, cost is priority number one, two and three. And nearly everything uh, you speak to them about will be related to cost in uh, some uh, degree. Now, retailers have always been pretty good at managing costs. If you go back five years ago, cost was a top five topic. In March 2020, it became uh, a top three topic. And as I mentioned, it is now uh, possibly topic one, two and three at the top of their agenda. If you look overall over the last 10 years, retailer profitability has declined by 50% globally. That's a startling number, that is. And margin protection measures have to be at the top uh, of the list, as I've just alluded to. But we also know at the same time, nobody has ever saved themselves to greatness. And if you go back to the 08, 09 Great Recession, we saw all sorts of funky measures is starting to be put in place uh, and I do appreciate this differs from category to category mm -hmm. but in food we saw a very significant reduction in pack prices Walker's crisps went from 75 grams to 60 grams and then 50 gram uh, packs for an example if you think in the gaming space uh, certain add-ons etc were just taken out and were used uh, to uh, to upsell uh, at a uh, later degree but also to reduce development costs if you think uh, in in other categories, uh, you could argue increasingly corners were cut. And that doesn't mean corners were cut around the quality, uh, but corners were cut uh, increasingly to reduce costs. So this is a brutal, brutal focus for the industry uh, at this uh, point in time and is not going to get any better. I was quoted in the Financial Times a couple of weeks ago, uh, highlighting that I believe in food retailing, up to 20% of the pre-COVID cost base has to be addressed in the next 12 to 24 months. In non-food retailing, a lot of uh, the sectors you guys operate in, that is up to 50% of the pre-COVID costs. Now, a lot of people tell me that is impossible. Well, I do an awful lot of work in this space. And it is actually, and no retailer has a pot of gold hidden underneath the stairwell and anywhere, but it is looking at every single operational lever and understanding which part you can optimise. Now, I appreciate you're not going to get 50% cost saving overnight. You need to understand where are the easy and the quick wins uh, and what are the areas that will require significantly more structural change and will take a lot longer uh, to succeed in doing. But if you think in supply chain, in uh, HR, in finance, be it around automation, be it around changing suppliers, etc., if you can optimise multiple areas, we happen to have a list of over 300 cost levers in retail. If you can optimise every single one by 0.2%, then you start getting to the type of numbers I have uh, just highlighted. And we generally think of four key areas when uh, we speak uh, of uh, cost optimization. The first, and Peter, building on your theme earlier, is around range and assortment. It is generally pretty badly understood within retailers is how to manage the right range. You have a marketplace uh, based out of Seattle uh, that happens to list 280 million SKUs today. If you're a physical retailer, there's no chance to compete with 280 million SKUs. But therefore, uh, ranges have significantly proliferated over recent years. But do you really need 157 different types of ketchup in store? Think of the working capital tied up up in 157 different uh, brands and pack sizes. Think of the supply chain complexity. Think uh, of uh, the amount of people you need back in head office to manage all of those supplier relationships. So I predict a significant exercise, and it is already happening, to reduce ranges for those that uh, have uh, an over-expanded range uh, by 30% over uh, the next uh, couple of months and years. But it's not purely about skew reduction. 
the graveyard of failed skew reduction schemes is very, very large. I remember a very large retailer out of uh, Bentonville in Arkansas in the US uh, back in the early noughties under Project Impact or the Clean Store Initiative, as it was called. They took out 30% of their SKUs. They didn't understand that Aunt Bessie's Jam was basically a $100 basket builder, and they delisted it as uh, the actual unit sales were pretty low. Every customer that bought that jam went to one of their competitors, and they lost $2.5 billion within. 12 months. The key is, is understanding what the right range is. It's not about reduction or expanding uh, by uh, reason of just doing it. It's the analytics sitting behind it, understanding what the right range is, and far too few businesses do that. The second area around cost is under, unsurprisingly connected to real estate. Up until 2015, specifically in the UK, but I'm seeing this in the Middle East, I'm seeing this in a number of other countries, we are over-retailed. We have too many stores in specific categories, and we know the market is changing. I am not predicting that the store is dead. And even in 10 years from now, physical stores will still be the largest channel out there in the marketplace. But you need to know where stores make most sense and what return of investment you are getting. I was saying earlier, I have an hour with the Secretary of State tomorrow regarding uh, a uh, potential uh, degree of restructuring that I am predicting will come back uh, into retail. If you think up until uh, 2020, we saw many, many failures. We saw lots of CVAs, uh, and that, of course, stopped uh, as soon as the pandemic uh, hit, apart from Arcadia, because the government uh, built various protective measures and we had the lowest degree of corporate failures in the UK uh, for many, many years. Uh, a stat for those of you that are interested in restructuring, on average in the UK, 25,000 businesses go bust every year. In 2020 and 2021, it was only 7,500 uh, on average. So that's a, that's a really interesting stat, that is. So I am predicting more retailers to hit troubled waters uh, from uh, the, uh, the summer again, specifically with all of the cost challenges I am referencing. And therefore, government is really interested to understand what uh, they can do in this context. But real estate is one of the biggest challenges in this context. It is a fixed cost, uh, and if you have too many of them that are not making any money, and there are some retailers where a third of their store estate is not profitable. That is just a startling fact, that is. So you're running these big boxes, and you're actually paying uh, to run these boxes. So you're going to have to use analytics to be much, much better to understand the location, uh, both from a macro perspective and much, much better from a micro perspective around space planning. How much space do you dedicate to category A versus category B, for example? And the rental business model is changing. We're moving increasingly uh, to footfall or turnover related rents. If the shopping centre doesn't generate enough footfall, why should you pay? It's exactly the same uh, as if uh, you uh, take a stand at an exhibition and nobody comes. Why should should you be paying uh, the full whack to the uh, event organisers. The third key area uh, is all around pricing and promotion. And Peter, you mentioned this earlier. I'm just writing a paper uh, with uh, my uh, academic friends again. I believe there is $100 billion of margin left on the table every year globally through the complete lack of understanding around pricing and promo elasticity. And the only way you can really change that is by truly understanding the shopper mission that sits behind it. If I go back to that family of four that have £30 to spend on food every week and they sadly face the choice of eat versus heat once we hit the winter, they're all about value. And you don't need to do any promotion to them about anything but price. And for them, EDLP, everyday low prices, will be the determinator of where they shop. But if I am a more affluent shopper and I'm hosting a dinner party on Saturday and the home delivery didn't deliver three critical ingredients, 
I am not price sensitive. I will be a distressed purchaser and I will go anywhere that has these products that are available and I will broadly pay any price to get them. Now you need to know though if I am that shopper or that shopper. I am not advocating individual prices in store. We're not there yet. Amazon has piloted that with uh, some of its uh, bookstores in the US uh, where you have personalized pricing. But increasingly, an online is a great opportunity to really drive uh, price personalization. We will see more and more of that in years to come. In Japan, they have kiosks selling carbonated soft drinks that are directly related and they have a temperature uh, measurement device uh, called a thermometer in their vending machines uh, that is directly linked to the weather. If it's hot, uh, the price of water is higher, which is sort of a bit of an obvious stat. If it's cold, uh, the price of coffee uh, is higher. And you wouldn't think that that is rocket science sitting behind it. It's a very, very simple fact. And those type or that type of thinking increasingly will have to go into uh, price and promo management. As most retailers and most brands that have gone direct to consumer, they really lack any detailed understanding of elasticity behind it. I've just done, uh, when I say I, it's always the team uh, sitting behind me, a very intriguing project with one of the largest forecourt operators in the world. Uh, they, they had changed the oil price on the pump about 700 times uh, in the last two years. They had not changed 50% uh, of their prices in their convenience store for over five years. Guess what? Forecourt retailers make more money in their convenience store than selling petrol these days. So it just showcases the opportunity that is out there. And then the fourth big area from a cost perspective is related to investment in technology and supply chain. For decades, retailers have been very, very focused on opening stores, and that was the blueprint. If you look at the retail value chain, you source great product, you ship product, you sell product, and if you're good at it, you open more physical stores. And that was the, some may call it the vicious uh, circle, because of that is how most retail leaders have been brought up all the way until recent times. Now, with the fragmentation to the root uh, of market, with online growing, with social commerce, dare I say the metaverse, uh, and NFTs starting to generate revenue, that route to market has become more and more fragmented, and therefore your investment uh, into uh, different channels and uh, the resources that support them also has to diversify. Most BRICS retailers will invest 90% of their annual capex budget in opening stores or refurbishing stores. And I held a really fascinating panel with the CIO of the uh, largest global marketplace. Their name was referenced a few minutes ago and the largest physical retailer on the planet. The physical retailer spends 1.6% of their global revenue, which is multi, multi billion dollars on technology. That's a big number. But 90% of that very big number is basically to keep the lights on. 10% is around innovation. That very large uh, marketplace that happens to come from Washington State, uh, Washington State in the US, they invest 27% of their revenue in customer facing technology. In the US, they are the two single biggest competitors. What do you do if you have an 18 times disadvantage against a business like that? So that showcases you increasingly are going to have to pivot your investments into other areas. I'll then come to supply chain. Look, you spoke and you showed uh, a picture of empty shelves over the last 12 months. Supply chain bottlenecks have become even more uh, significant and I predict those will continue till at least 2024. Speaking to the chairman of a very large Swedish retailer that happened to have large yellow and blue boxes in multiple countries around the world. They had modeled pre the Ukraine crisis 
uh, this to endure until 2023. They now think uh, this will happen until 2024. And this is not just the UK. This is the US. This is uh, continental Europe. Moving products around is becoming increasingly more difficult. A very famous American general, a chap called Omar Bradley, who commanded US forces in Northern Africa and then in Italy uh, during the Second World War, said strategy is for beginners, logistics and supply chain uh, is for the experts, and I wouldn't disagree with him. If you can't get product on uh, shelf, irrelevant if this is a physical or a digital shelf, you've got nothing to sell. And we're seeing this across multiple product categories. Then, of course, the ESG agenda. This is becoming an increasingly important societal topic. The health of the consumer, the health of the planet are, especially for the younger generation of consumers, uh, becoming really important purchase topics. And you would argue retail is behind the curve. In a recent survey by uh, Source for Consulting, which is the trade body that, and the research body that looks after the uh, management consulting industry, they asked 250 EMA CEOs about their buying preferences or needs over the next years. And E, environmental matters, ranked as number eight for the retail sector, societal matters as number 11, and sadly, governance, uh, which is basically uh, any uh, abiding by any regulatory um, themes, uh, number five. So that was the most important to ensure you don't sit on the naughty step. But I would argue environmental and societal are going to have have to become more important but in retail and we're speaking in foods the average profit margin of two to three percent in non-food the average profit margin of four to eight percent most people will tell you guess how many mars bars i have to sell before i can become an eco warrior you cannot go in with that topic as number one but if you connect it with the supply chain and the cost agenda, you're onto something. If you can switch your supply chain to be closer to home, you can source closer to home, guess what? You are starting to create local jobs, you're serving your local communities, and you're reducing your carbon footprint. So those are the type of initiatives we will see more of. Yes, I appreciate there will always be manufacturing production uh, capability bottlenecks in many countries around the world. But if you go into a retailer and say, you're going to have to do this, 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 and this to be uh, nicer to the planet, they will always tell you, well, what's, what's the payback on that? And by the way, if we don't make any profit, we can't do anything for the planet. So it is that balancing act that is going to be key. Channel convergence is something we've been speaking about for many years, and we've been speaking about the significant acceleration of online. Pre-COVID in the UK, online stood at about 18%. It's now 30% of uh, the market. I'm not in the camp, though, that online will take 50%. That's not where I am. I think it will go to 35 to 38% by 2030 which is, of course, a significant acceleration, but it does mean other channels, and specifically the physical channel, will remain really important for the foreseeable future. But as I'll explain in the moment, increasingly channels are irrelevant. As human beings, if I go and interview 50 people on Oxford Street and say, are you an online channel shopper or uh, do you uh, uh, use social channels? People will look at me as if I'm raving mad because of, most consumers have no idea what a channel is. They just want to get the right product at the right price at the right time in the right location for them. We have become obsessed in the industry by measuring channel profitability, etc., etc. And the biggest sign that the future world is channel irrelevant is that the large global e-commerce players are all opening stores. The largest retailer in China happens to be owned by Alibaba today. Most people have no idea of that. And you look at the top 10 retailers in China, physical retailers, and every single one of those is either owned 
co-owned or in a significant partnership with one of the technology platforms. You think of Boohoo opening on Regent Street. You think, uh, sorry, Gymshark opening on Regent Street. You think of Boohoo opening a department store in Manchester. You think of that large global marketplace I referenced, hiring uh, the former COO of Tesco to open 300 physical stores in Europe by 2025. So channel convergence is happening in both directions. BRICS players are becoming much uh, more uh, online savvy. I hate the word omnichannel uh, or multi-channel. Uh, it is uh, basically a hybrid model that is the future. And then the final uh, why is, of course, the consumer. Retail for decades has been about great products, great prices and great locations. Well, guess what? You still need to have all of that. But if you don't know who she or he is you're interacting with, you cannot win. And the investment required into true understanding of who the individuals are. And look, I'm not advocating Big Brother and being creepy and knowing everybody's sort of home address uh, and what they're having for breakfast, etc. But you do need to understand much more about the individual consumer. And we spoke earlier uh, about the shopping mission of that family that has got a food budget uh, and uh, the individual who had missed out on uh, some dinner party ingredients. If you don't know these things, you cannot offer the right price, you cannot offer the right assortment, you cannot decide on the right locations. That is going to be really key. Where a lot of businesses are struggling at the moment, that over the last two and a half years, behaviours have changed. But certain behaviours are now going back to pre-COVID levels, but not all behaviours. So therefore, being more and more attuned to what consumers are thinking is really, really pivotal. And that then translates into, well, what are the three things that businesses need to have top of their list at the moment? The first, of course, is the constant, and Peter, apologies for slightly disagreeing, because I never like the term revolution, um, because of being a historian, revolution always ends in uh, carnage and sadly far too many people losing their lives. But it is constant evolution. And humans do not like change. But that is what's needed in this point in time. And constantly understanding and re-evaluating your business model is absolutely key. There are too many Kodak businesses out there that just forgot to evolve, uh, invented the digital camera and sort of thought it was a fad and uh, a couple of years later went bust. And there are too many of those examples and there will be more. I predict some of the biggest names that all of us know, not just in retail, will go bust in the next 10 to 20 years because they're not evolving fast enough. That is going to be key. I always describe it a bit like painting the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. It takes two years to paint it. And guess what? The day you're finished, you go all the way to the front and you start again. That is basically what you have to do in this environment. And why do you have to do it? Because if you have to grow, businesses have to deliver growth. And for leaders in businesses, yes, the cost agenda is going to be absolutely front of mind. But if you don't understand how to grow, you will fail. And you're going to have to use new technologies. You're going to have to think new partnerships. And no doubt, Chris will speak about collaboration in much more detail earlier. I have a whole theme on that topic. Retailers are notorious for collaboration instead of collaboration. But if you, and as I put it here on this slide, you have to increasingly think about the end-to-end -end value chain. All the way from farm to fork, agribusiness, ingredient manufacturers, manufacturers, retailers, consumers, that's where you can optimize the different touch points. Retailers and many other businesses in that value chain are really good at optimizing the vertical. They don't think the horizontal often enough. So business model evolution is key. Of course, the supply chain piece, as I've mentioned, is short to midterm a key priority. We are not going to see the bottlenecks go in the short term and therefore understanding how you re-engineer your network is going to be pivotal and then cost, cost, cost. 
and you're going to have to think cost, 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 because if you need to invest it to transform your business from a business model perspective. So now, the big question is, well, what will the future look like? So I've already mentioned the word retail will become obsolete and we will move into what I call the ecosystem of consumer commerce. And I think there'll be seven types of businesses that will win in this context. If you look at the top of the triangle, you've got the platform ecosystems. We all know the big names, be they from the US or from uh, China, they are increasingly taking market share. They are not just reliant on the B2C or the B2B channel. They often sell other capabilities as alternative revenue streams, be it cloud computing, uh, be it advertising, be it payments, etc., etc. So they're not just reliant on selling physical products or physical services uh, to the consumer. What is really fascinating that increasingly multinational retailers have understood that there is a real opportunity as a platform player to grow and the number uh, of those businesses have started to move into this space. One of uh, the uh, local examples is Next. Uh, they launched their total platform a couple of years ago and Simon Wolfson, their chief executive, who I think is one of the smartest retailers, uh, not just in the UK, has said, if I purely sell physical product in physical locations by 2030, I will be bust. I need to understand how I sell my supply chain, my marketing, my IT capabilities, and I actually need to allow my biggest competitors onto my platform. When I speak of platforms, many businesses think e-commerce. And speaking to some of the largest carbonated soft drink manufacturers uh, a couple of weeks ago, I said to them, if you're A, would you sell your biggest competitor? And we know these guys are not generally the best friends. Are you prepared to sell your biggest competitor's products on your platform and make them sell more? That's what a platform ecosystem is because it's not a linear business model. Uh, it is a circular business model and uh, you are taking revenue from bringing buyers and sellers together. So that's the top of the triangle. We then move to uh, the left of the triangle, and this is where you have the true omnichannel players. True omnichannel players have to be channel agnostic and customer centric. But boy, this is gonna be a busy place. Most of today's operators are gonna to gravitate to this space. And only if they pursue the radical cost agenda I was just describing, will they succeed as they're going to need an incredible amount of investment to succeed in this space. And here, of course, you've got the brands who are increasingly going direct to consumer. We know it's not easy to go direct to consumer if you are a manufacturer. Increasingly, they are using members in the top part of the triangle who are offering platform as a service propositions to actually generate or to drive their own uh, digital sales. And if you want to look at the most extreme form of this, just go to the lifestyle or the Alicia categories uh, where the likes of Adidas and Nike have over the last years announced going from 25,000 retail partners globally to 800. They only want to work with 800 retailers globally. Everybody else has been kicked out and the rest of the business will go through uh, their mono brand stores or their dot com business. If you're unlucky to have not made the cut of those 800 retailers, tough luck, you don't get any product anymore. That is just how they're operating. And more and more brands are thinking, how can I cut out those annoying retailers that are taking margin and do it myself? Luckily for the retailers, uh, many are struggling to do it themselves at this point in time, but we will see more and more of this uh, evolution happen over the years. And brand manufacturers often play in the sort of 10 
to 25% margin, so they have more uh, to play with than a lot of the retailers. The national heroes of many of the high street brands we know today, those big retailers uh, around uh, Europe, around the US, they're going to find it really, really difficult to survive. And in some cases, and if you take the consumer electronics category as an example, there's only really one still left standing. In food, there's five or six standing, but we will see consolidation if the competition authorities allow this. And then, of course, you've got the value-based retailers, the discounters. They are, from an operating model perspective, normally double as profitable as uh, their national hero uh, competitors. They're much leaner, uh, but they're going to have to crack online. That is going to be the big challenge for them. Or you go to the right of the triangle, and this is where you have the category specialists, businesses, and if I use Dunelm Pets at Home uh, in the UK as examples, really good at uh, given categories, often 5% or less market share in those categories, fly underneath the radar of the multiples and uh, the large marketplaces, superior service, better product knowledge, they will prevail. But if they grow, they either have to go up or they have to go to the left side of the triangle. And one of the few positive developments of COVID have been the independents, with many of us spending more time in local catchment areas. Uh, we are seeing a revitalization of footfall in <coughs> tier three high streets. But what we've also seen is that the independents now don't just have to sell to their local catchment area via platforms like Shopify. They've also expanded uh, globally. And there's uh, a really, really interesting revitalization of that part of the industry. In the UK, the independents held 4.2% market share pre-COVID. It's now back to 7%. So that's been quite a positive development. So, Paul, a, a question, if I may. Yes, you may. Um, Tesco, five years ago, seemed to be going down a platform ecosystem basis where they had places where you could essentially sell through a, almost a marketplace. They've backed off that. Well, they seem to have backed off that. So it's a really interesting one. So you are right that under Sir Terry and under Philip, it was all about buying additional adjacent businesses and bundling it all together. The problem is they never bundled it together. No. They were all separate businesses, apart from there was maybe a giraffe or Harrison Hall in a Tesco store. Philip was all about that sort of digital network. Uh, we all know that an accounting scandal uh, didn't sort of uh, help uh, his career prospects. And then, of course, he had to leave. Uh, Mr. Unilever came in, and it was all about fixing the business after they had a six, seven billion pound loss connected with the accounting scandal. It was all about fixing the business. Ken, who arrived two years ago, had the question, well, look, I've got the bank, I've got mobile, I've got grocery, and I've got a very significant loyalty business. What do I do with these four disparate parts of the business uh, if they're not connected? The short answer is, well, you either connect them or you sell them. And if you think of what they're doing with Clubcard now and how they're linking that with the different parts of the business, they're on the journey of connecting it. So they used to have... I would say a house of brands, now they are increasingly going towards a platform ecosystem, but they're still a long, long way away from where they need to go. If you're not one of these seven businesses by 2030, or let me take a step back, by 2030, you need to make a decision what you want to be. So you have to define what you want to be, then you need to design, and it's either buy, build, or partner, and then you pilot, and then you implement. If you're not one of these seven business models, I think you're toast. I don't think you'll survive, and I don't think you'll be around. And I think COVID has accelerated the needs to change quite significantly. So here the question, of course, is, well, how? How do I change? And the really interesting point here, and I mentioned this earlier, and look, every consulting firm has some type of framework. This is our framework. It's called the Connected Enterprise. Together with Forrester, over a four-year period, we researched 250 large transformation programs of some of the best-known businesses around the world. And we were interested to understand why they succeed, but more importantly, why they fail. 
And I mentioned earlier that increasingly businesses, when they are transforming, focus on optimising the verticals. How can I make my supply chain better? How can I make my HR function, my finance function, my buying and merchandising, my sales function, how can they be better? And nearly every business does that. But what many businesses forget, well, if I change something in supply chain, that has direct implications on the customer function. It has direct implications on finance. They are all seamlessly integrated. And that's why we call this model the connected enterprise. And the real, real travesty, and I spend a lot of my time with chief executives in the UK and around the world, that are speaking about a digital and omni-transformation. And what those two buzzwords are all about are connecting silos, and they're doing the polar opposite. They are transforming in silos, and they're then really surprised that if you take a jigsaw puzzle uh, and the corners uh, are suddenly tried to put together, and it doesn't work. And our research showed us there are eight key disciplines that you need to focus on. Slightly dependent on the business model you choose on the previous slide. Some will be more, some will be less important. But if you don't cover off all eight of these, the likelihood of failure is 70%. And that's startling. The amount of money that goes into these transformation journeys is, in some cases, hundreds of millions. But if you don't do this, the likelihood of failure is 70%. And that's what the research showed us. So the first here is insight-driven strategies and actions. If you are increasingly not relying on smart data to really drive the decisions, which in retail, and I am a retailer uh, by uh, trade, where gut feeling still plays an important role, but increasingly if you don't have that smart information, and Peter very eloquently spoke about uh, some very bad decision making without data in the past, you cannot succeed. You will always need innovative products and services. Lots of people tell me, and of course, you go to luxury retail or apparel retail, and it's all about the product. Yes, of course it's about the product. If you've got toot, nobody's going to buy it. Well, guess what? In some places they do. But in certain categories, it is about the product. But the product's not enough. It has to be more than that. Experience centricity by design. That's horrible consulting jargon for really understanding the customer and the employer journey. So everything you do, map that experience journey of the customer and uh, the employee into uh, your overall process flow. Yes, you need brilliant responsive operations and supply chain. I quoted the American general a few minutes ago. If you haven't got that, which is the backbone of any organization, you can't succeed. Integrated partner and alliance ecosystem. Chris will speak about collaboration, and I mentioned it earlier. Collaboration is going to be key. The historic retail value chain, as I mentioned, was all about you source product, you ship product, you sell product. It's got a lot more complicated today. You need to know about the customer. You need to have digital supply chains. You need to have all sorts of people in the sort of tax and, uh, and, and incentive scheme. So you need to rely on partners. And guess what? The Googles, the Microsofts, they've got lots and lots of data engineers and scientists. So if you're bringing them onto projects or you work with them as a vendor, then get them to solve some of your most uh, difficult problems for you. Digitally enabled technology architecture, everything you do has to have technology as the foundation. Technology is not the solution, but it is the catalyst uh, to help human beings solve uh, problems. Aligned and empowered workforce. If you don't bring your people with you, you cannot succeed. And I mentioned 70% of transformation journeys fail if you don't do these eight. But other research also shows us that the rational solution is only 30%. The rest is political and emotional. If you haven't brought the team on the journey, all the stakeholders on the journey, uh, they will rebel behind the scenes and it won't happen. And then everything you do has to be seamlessly connected. Otherwise, if 
the online, the offline, the social uh, channels do not tell the same story, which doesn't mean the same price, by the way, or the same promotion, but if they're not integrated, you cannot win. So those are the eight key hows. I could spend hours and hours about all the details sitting behind uh, this. We use this framework with many uh, organizations over the last couple of years. And the research shows us that if you do this from an EBITDA perspective, you have two times impact. And then my final slide is also about how do you measure success in the future? If you think to the left side of the screen, the way we measure success today is based on three key criteria. The first is, of course, the product dimension. Do I buy for less than I sell? What is my gross margin, my intake margin, my net margin? And then we think channels. How much revenue does my e-commerce channel generate versus my convenience store channel? How many What's the marketing spend associated with that channel? What's the headcount? What's the real estate cost associated with that channel? And then we create channel P&Ls, and then we compare them with each other, and we go like, wow, why are we even doing this? Because it's not making us any money. And then the rudimentary afterthought is often the customer. And we use mechanics like MPS scoring, etc. Now, if you think of some of the fastest growing businesses, those that are at the top of the triangle on the previous slide, they've inverted this pyramid and they've put customer and purpose at the base of their thinking. What's the lifetime value of every customer? Do I even want you as a customer? Because if you only ever buy on promotion and you send things back 17 times, so I don't make any money from you, I actually don't want you as a customer. What's the net acquisition? What's the net retention cost? And by the way, how can I show that I as an organization stand for more than just making profits? What's my purpose? That is increasingly becoming the base layer of those businesses. More and more businesses are thinking of how do they adapt to this. Product will always have to remain important. If you don't buy for less than you sell, you're screwed. So uh, that's the key mantra that will remain. And channel becomes an afterthought. It's broadly irrelevant. So if in a world where 35% of your sales are digital and you're going to the capital markets and you're speaking about sales per square meter, you've clearly got something wrong. And if you think today that Tesco's market capitalization is about the same as Ocado's, one generates 80 billion turnover, one generates 2 billion or 2 and something billion turnover, it does show you and I can tell you which organization uses that measurement criteria and which organization uses that measurement criteria, that increasingly when you're growing, when you're raising equity or debt to fuel uh, your growth, you're having to speak about performance in a very, very different way. That was a lot of information. I know I took a few minutes longer than I uh, was intending to, but I hope that resonated and very, very happy to take questions. Thank you very much, uh, Paul, I think. Whoops. I'll cut myself. Thank you very much. Some, I have to say, some of this really resonates. When I um, think of our own, uh, it, we had a big transition where we tried to implement digital sales at, at, uh, at EA. And I think uh, Jason will remember this. We came up with a division. We separated and created a unique division called .com. And it was... You know, the rest of the company was told, don't worry, worry your pretty little heads about this. You, know, you carry selling to uh, the, the physical retailers and .com will sort this out. And um, it was a disaster. We spent $2 billion on this and it collapsed and it became .com. <laughs> and um, it actually caused our CEO at the time, who was CEO, to actually have to resign. Uh, and the reason why is he, 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 he isolated, it didn't take into account the rest of the organization. And so the rest of the organization was trying to make it not work. So even though it was the right thing, you know, so it, was, it really resonated to me. And I think your, your thing about channel um, for us um, is very interesting. I, I, I know several of you sitting here have got, uh, will have... Um, uh, like digital sales, I'm sort of looking up, looking up in a Warner's way, but it will have like a digital sales team, which is completely not really separated from, a, from the rest of the sales team. And um, um, my former company is still very much like that. 
And uh, I, I wonder whether that's going to be coming, um, that needs to become more integrated as the retailers follow through. It's very interesting. So,